Are you ready? Can crush us. Hey. It don't really get no better than better this. The than. podcast that you're looking for. If you're really heavy in the wrestling, hosted by the Mark. Energy that's so amazing. Gotta keep it entertaining. Rep the can crush a nation. Yeah, you know what's going down in the ring. Lights out when you hit a ding ding. ding, ding. Knock them out like boom, bada bing. Hold it down, you can crown me the king. Gotta shout out to the Miz and Duke the dumpster. We choke slamming everybody, power driving. Hit them with a face buster. Yeah, yeah. This the show you need an and it ain't no need for waiting. Mark, hold it down for the can crush a nation. All about wrestling and keep it entertaining. Can crushers wrestling podcast. Time to break them. Let's go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can crushers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can crushers. Let's go. Everyone, this is Ringside Rain, and you're listening to Can Crushers Podcast. And now, here is your host, Mark the Mark Martinez. And welcome back to another Can Crushers Wrestling Spotlight. I am your host, Mark the Mark Martinez, and it's a big one because rejoining me because it's part two is the English professor, John. I know you're biting at the bit because you said. As we close the last time when we talked to Glenn Spector, the big boss, you were excited to do this again. Yeah, the last uh, episode we did with him was just uh, so full of crazy, wackadoo stories um, that we couldn't fit it all into, into one show. Um, so we have to do a part two. I'm, I'm curious to find out. Obviously, we're going to hear more wackadoo stories, but... Um, I want to learn a little more about the training. That, that That's an aspect of pro wrestling that's always fascinated me. Um, you know, who, who were some stars that, uh, that he's trained um, and who were some duds maybe that he's trained? doesn't have the name names, but I'm just curious, you know, maybe what he saw in some of these uh, people that have come through his program. I want to hear more stories. I want to hear about – Chickens wrestling. Well, here it goes on the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah chickens all that stuff. wrestling and eating them right after your match. And who the hell knows what else is going to come out of his mouth? It's late, so this could either uh, keep me up all night or give me the energy to edit it tomorrow. So I'm excited. Plus, plus, we have to talk about September 10th with him. He's taking on Andrew Palace at Comeback to Clearfield. Clearfield Comeback. Come around to Clearfield. Something is called Comeback and Clearfield's all in it. But it's an IWC show. First time back in two years. Hopefully he knows. That's, uh, I'm sure he's got his ducks in a row. He knows who he's wrestling and when. Um, that's a big match. Because Andrew Palace, um, I mean, he's a star. He is uh, an IWC legend. That's a big match for Glenn. Yeah. I, I agree. He knocks off Palace. He's knocking on the door then of Mandime. Yeah, I think without a doubt, if you knock off Andrew Palace, you can uh, go to Jenny Plummer's office and say, hey, kind of want a title shot. Yeah, for sure. For sure. All right. Uh, a couple things before we get going. You guys know where to find us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, all those cool ones. But we have to tell you about something, John, I actually have it on right before bed. I have my old school, the original collar and elbow shirt on. It says property collar and elbow. Still one of my favorites. Still comfortable. Not stretched out. And you can buy one too, right? Well, you have one. But I mean, everybody else can. Absolutely. I've got, um, I don't know, seven or eight of them. And I love them all. Well, there you go. Use the promo code CAN CRUSHERS, all one word, capital C and CAN, capital C and CRUSHERS. And John, how much did you save? You save 10% when you use that promo code. There you go. All right, here comes Al to tell you more about Collar and Elbow. And then get ready for wackadoo stories because the return of Glenn Spector is moments away. Wrestling, a love and a passion we all share. I've started a wrestling brand, the wrestling brand. A brand founded on the aspects of wrestling. Two entities working together to create a product that connect emotionally for people everywhere. 
Collar and Elbow is the brand. Passion and love for wrestling is the drive. I am Al Snow, and this is Collar and Elbow, the wrestling brand. And welcome back to another Can Crushers podcast. Uh, there, there's no way to get going. John's on the line, and the return of the big boss is here, Glenn Spector. Glenn, hey, how the hell are you doing tonight? I am doing fantastic. I'm doing really well. Uh, a lot of stuff going on, and I'm ready to tell you all about it. Uh, past stuff, present stuff, all kinds of good stuff. You, your episode, and I'm not going to let John talk during this one. Your episode broke records. I, I don't know if it was just shenanigans, the whatever that we went on. But yeah, it, it, it's the highest listened one that we have now, and it's... I don't know if it's made in Japan yet. I didn't deep dive into my stats like that just because I've been <laughs> like that, but I hope so. I've got so. a few more funny Japan stories, so we, we can top it all off. I, I've, got, I've got the Japan story to end all Japan stories. So, um, I, one, I cannot believe I even brought, I didn't bring up the last time, so it'll be perfect. I, I, I promise whoever just tuned in, you're going to want to stay for the whole thing, and I am not underselling it or overselling it. <laughs> He's not. Japan story to end all Japan stories. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so I guess what the first thing I'm going to start off with, though, is that I, I do have a couple. Um, you know, the the big boss is going to be showing up for IWC on September 10th. That's going to be in Clearfield. It's at the Clearfield comeback. And Big Bout already announced me at Lock and Horns with Andrew Palace. Andrew Palace, you know, fan favorite. The crowd loves him, so you know I'm going to hate him. Um, respect him as an athlete, great athlete. Unfortunately, he's let Katie Arquette, some Daffy Dame, get in his head. Uh, I always, I, I always make it a point never to mix business and pleasure. I'm all business in the ring. Uh, and Andrew Palace is going to find out all about that on September 10th. So wait, Katie didn't come to you for punishment because I know Katie. No, been... she, she absolutely did. Okay. But here's the thing: okay, like, yeah. you, but you called her Daffy, you're... so. Well, oh, no, no, all, all respect to Katie Arquette, too, but you have to understand that, like, when I look at a situation like this, this is the problem of what happens when you, when you, when you mix business with any kind of relationship. The ring is not a place for romance or love or friendship or any of that other nonsense. That's his mistake. Katie Arquette didn't come to me and didn't try to lure me with any kind of feminine wiles or anything like that. Don't get me wrong. She paid, you know, the check's good, it cleared. Like, they, they don't, you know, don't misunderstand my relationship with Katie Arquette. It's all business. I am, I have no interest in terms of the, in terms of the wrestling business and being in the ring with anything other than cash in hand. So she paid in full already. Wow. Uh, well, you know, the, the, the big boss, the man on his word. And here's the thing that you need to understand. And I'll give you a little preview. There's a promo coming out where I explain this. I don't want to get into it. Andrew Palace's head any more than he's already in his own head. That's his own fault. That is a mistake, a prison of his own making. But <laughs> I do think it's important for people to understand that <laughs> Katie Arquette did not pay me to pin or beat Andrew Palace. That's why I've been paid in full, my friend, because she knows that I am going to do the one thing that I do best. I am going to hurt Andrew Palace. I don't really care about the final outcome of the match. That's not my job. My job is to beat Andrew Palace up and win, lose, or draw, though I can pretty much guarantee you I'm going to win if you've ever seen me in the ring. But win, lose, or draw, uh, Andrew Palace is going to be walking out of that ring with damage. Okay. Okay, so let, let's let's talk about business for just a little bit since you brought that up um mark and i uh, would agree and i think you would too andrew palace been around a long time iwc legend we've seen him go through some hell in a lot of his matches sure um what what are you going to bring that's uh what's your strategy for this match what are you bringing that's a little different how are you going to beat this guy 
I, I don't know that there's anything different than, than what I'm going to do. I, I, I think Andrew Powell is going to have to adapt to what I do because what I do, I just do better. Um, I'm the hardest hitting striker on the roster. There's no doubt about that. Uh, you know, I've seen him get into things like chop wars and strike wars before. I do not think he can stand with me. Um, you know, and the reality is there's an experience edge and Andrew Palace was once again, man, well, with all due respect, I, I, you know, and I, I'm the big boss is no man's fool. I don't go into any of these matches without scouting people first, a great competitor, mad props to him, uh, you know, but at the same time, a lot of these kids do just, they just don't get it, man. There is nothing they've done that I haven't seen a thousand times. Um, and I think the experience edge, the power edge, you know, the, I mean, don't get me wrong. He's got youth and enthusiasm, but I've got to tell you that treachery and experience beats that every time. Yeah. Yeah. So Mark and I touched on this in the intro, Glenn, that um, should you win and you essentially guarantee to win, um, should you win? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't like to go into things with the attitude of losers. That's the difference. Of course not. That's, that's the difference between me and all the IWC fans. The reason they're on the other side of the, of the divide of the guardrail is because they're losers. I'm a winner. If you look at me, if you see the wealth I've won and everything else, there's no doubt about it. Like we know how success is measured in this country. I epitomize that. So, yes, indeed, like, you know, of course, I'm going to guarantee a victory. I am a winner. And and when you do beat him, when you do beat him, do you then because you you will have beaten a legend. Do you go to Jenny Plummer and say, hey, Jenny, stop, I think it's stop, 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 stop. Before we go any further, who are you talking to? Who is it you think is on the other end of this conversation? I apologize. Andrew Palace is not a legend to me. (laughs) <laughs> like, I, I don't understand why you keep saying this. Uh, once again, I feel like I've given Andrew Palace all the credibility he needs and he deserves. But please understand, if if we're talking about who's a legend in this match in terms of his IWC career, it's me. So I like I want to full stop this right off the bat. Like he needs to worry about who he's stepping into the ring with, not the other way around. Okay, so let me rephrase this: when you beat him. Are you looking for a title shot? I'm, I'm not concerned. Uh, and that sounds terrible, I know. But you have to understand that my legacy in professional wrestling, for the most part, is fulfilled. I'm here to make money and bust heads. And I train young kids and I teach them to have the right attitude going into this business. And that's to be about yourself. Get yourself over. Get that money. Uh, get that success. Like, that's my, you know, like that. My my goals in the business now are to get paid and hurt people. If that ends up in a title shot, that's fine. Like, fantastic. You know what I mean? But I'm not chasing anything. I, I'll say this. All those Glenn Spector fans out there, and I know you exist, you know, especially after, you know, the downloads of the last podcast. I know you guys exist. You want me to have a title shot? There's a guy you can contact. His last name is Plumber, and he owns IWC. Get on that IWC social media, get on that Facebook, get on that IWC Twitter, demand to see more of me. Yeah, but then phrase it to Jenny because Justin doesn't know how to run any of that stuff. (laughs) I forgot. I forgot. Contact Jenny Buffer. She's absolutely in charge of everything. (laughs) Right. All right. you, You have another date that you want to talk about as well. Uh, yeah, I don't know what uh, – I have no idea what IWC has planned for me yet. No, there's very there, – not a ton of it's been released other than an old nemesis of mine from Super Indy. We actually faced in Super Indy. Delirious is going to be there, which is pretty cool. Um, Super Indy 21, uh, I have been – I competed in not one, not two, but three Super Indy tournaments. Um, I don't know if that's the most. I Probably not. Um but I, I have competed in three Super Indie tournaments. I love the Super Indie thing. It, it's fantastic. Had some of the best matches in my career. Great ones to look back on now. You can find a lot of them, uh, you know, on IWC's Fight TV. Um, so, but uh, Super Indie 21 coming up on October 8th is another show you guys are not going to want to miss. Uh, Super Indie is always a spectacle. It's a fantastic show. It is one of the reasons that IWC is one of 
the premier independent federations in the United States. I mean, literally a handful of places I've worked that are, are, are on the level of IWC. Um, and so Super Indy is a big deal. If you're listening to this, this goes for anything. And if you want to go back and watch some of my past matches, both way in the past and also in the recent past, check them out on Fight TV. Um, Fight TV is great, great service. Like, it, you know, you can download these things. You can support indie wrestling. If you can't get to the show, make sure you buy a ticket to see it on Fight TV. Yeah, or the, that pay-per-view. the IWC Network for $9.99 a month. Yes. Yep, or the IWC Network for 99 Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, guys, and if you've never seen a little promotion real quick for IWC, if you've never seen a Super Indie and that's going to be your first look, go back and watch some. Get this IWC Network first. Watch some, and no disregard, Glenn, but you got Adam Cole, you got Jonathan Gresham, you have Orlando, you have Delirious, you have... It's a literal... It's, it's a literal... It's a Hall of Fame, who? yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a literal who's who. Yeah. Including Glenn Spector. Including Glenn Spector. Like, yeah, I agree. I agree. All right, is that the dirty work? Are we going to get into the cool stuff now? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. All right. Uh, but needless to say, two shows at least coming up. Um, please, you know what? I'll get my plug in now, but I'll probably throw one more at the end. Please, dude, guys, I'm an old guy. I got into social media super, super late. As I said on the last show, I just got a Twitter like like three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Like, please follow Glenn Spector on these social media platforms. I don't think it ma- I used to not think it matters. I guess it kind of does. I am a really late adopter. I, I I absolutely hate social media, but I'm getting better at it by the second. But please follow me. I need the follows. Yeah. Uh, and that, that goes for, uh, I'll say this, that goes for any wrestler that we have on the Can Crusher Spotlight. When they regurgitate their, their socials, go out. It helps them. It gives them into this random ass algorithm that I don't understand. But it helps them, so do it. And the, like I said, the worst part is I feel like promoters are looking at this more than looking at who's a good hand and who, who can handle themselves in the ring. But if that is the case, I at least want to make sure I've got enough people so that people realize, hey, I've got fans. People buy my T-shirts. People follow me. People contact me. You know, like people follow. I have people who travel, you know, have driven hours to see me on shows. I, I like you know, I'm trying to get some of that that realization back into promoters' heads so I can get out there and beat up a few more kids before my time's done. And maybe you'll just get a Japan story that you didn't hear oh, here. Yeah, yeah. Just, but we're gonna yeah. get we're trying to get them all on here. So I just have them oh, in my so back pocket all the time. Some, before I, I, I have a little bit of like I like I wanted to give you guys I wanted to give you guys kind of my best stories and stuff like that because like I there's there's stuff that it's funny. I'm eventually probably gonna write a book or a memoir if I ever and considered important enough who knows like maybe not <laughs> you know what i mean but uh but if i don't i want to make sure that i have this memorialized somewhere because i have these stories swimming around in my head and i don't want to lose them so um i do have some stories prepared but i know you guys have a couple questions so why don't you guys throw those questions at me well first right. john before backhand, yeah, yeah. backhanded compliment at potter god potter wrote a book you should be able to oh geez. i love him but yeah I wrote I wrote part of one of his books. I, yeah. wrote, I wrote I wrote an excerpt for one of his books. Yeah, no, Potter's the best man. You know that. And hey, what better place to uh, immortalize those stories than right here on Can Crushers, Mark? Right? I, I I absolutely believe that. I think you guys are doing yeah. great. I'll, I'll shit on you later because I'm a hero. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Right now, I'll be nice. Clearfield, I'm going to get a big hawker spit in my face. You're going to be Bret Hart, and I'm going to be Vince. <laughs> there we go. Glenn, I'm always fascinated by uh, wrestlers who train wrestlers. Mm-hmm. Um, was there, you don't have to name names, but was there a, a wrestler, man or woman, that you looked at that person and said, yes, he or she is a star? And why is that? What did you see in that person? I wouldn't say, like, you know what? Like, I, I don't want to think I have some kind of great eye for this. This is so hard. Like, you know, Triple H, I, I think I might have brought this up last show, but like Triple H said this whole, he had this great speech where he, uh, you know, he, I think he was verbally dueling with CM Punk of all people. And they were going back and forth. And he said, like, you know, like sometimes, sometimes I see a guy and I think he'll be nothing. And he ends up being the biggest thing in the world. And he was talking about John Cena, which to me is insane to look at John Cena. Like, I, I remember him as as prototype and not think that this guy has something to offer the business, which is crazy to me. Um 
you know, but like, but at the same time, I, I don't want to say like, oh yeah, I saw this and this guy and he became this, but I will say, um, I was pretty sure despite their size that Jake, uh, I never know if I'm pronouncing his new name correctly. It's his fed name. Uh, Joaquin Wild. Oh, uh, Zima Ion, Z- Joaquin uh, yeah. Wild. Yeah. 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 Like, so when, when Shima was training, um, when, 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 uh, Super Hentai, Shirley Doe, and I were training Shima, he was so respectful and he was such a, um, he had physical talent, but he was really small. But he really absorbed everything. He was very natural, if that makes any sense. And he was such a student. I was like, I definitely thought, like, I don't want to play, like, backing quarterback. I don't, I don't know that I ever thought he'd make it to the Fed. But I definitely was like, this kid has something. Same thing with Jason Gorey. Like, um, not, like, not, like, Jason Gorey was wilder. Like, he had a wilder personality. But I, I felt like I felt like I was like, this kid loves this and like he's going to do something. And he definitely is an accomplished guy. Um, you know, uh, that like those two stick out of my mind as like guys who I was just like, wow, that, you know, like um, I, you know, like I, I don't know what makes somebody do more, do less. Uh, Mickey Gambino was always like such a once again, super respectful student of the game. He's great. You know, and I don't know. And like I said, when I look at like, I'm like, why does this guy get picked? And why does this guy not get picked? Like, you know, why didn't Mickey Gambino ever get a contract? I have no idea. Like, you know, it's, it's like, it's hard to tell. Why didn't I ever get a Fed contract? You know, like sometimes it's hard to, it's hard to pinpoint. So I don't, I don't want to say like, like there's a luck factor in this. There's a, um, you know, a, there's, there's a skill factor. There's a luck factor. There's a work factor. Like you have to put it all together. Like you, you have to, the problem is you have to give it a hundred percent in your, in your work and you might never get picked. Like the, there is that chance. There's, there's, there's still a coin flip involved in all of this. So I, I like, I, I can't say I, whether I have a great eye for talent or not. Like I just know I kind of can recognize who works hard. And I feel like the guys who are working hard and have some talent, are going to be the guys who are successful. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Joaquin Wild. Um, that that guy's got some some natural charisma. Uh, we saw it in the IWC ring. We saw it on NXT. He has uh, an ability to really connect with the crowd. Um, but he worked on that. Like that's another thing. Like personality. Like I would not. If you had said to me like this is a guy who's going to get over with his personality, I would have been like, no, he's going to get over with his work. Like. Like, like I said, and, and he worked on all of that. He really is a student of the game. It's, it's imp- like, you know, I mean, you can't, you can't not be impressed. Like, and, the, and, and I will say the thing is, and as a guy who, uh, you know, I didn't know it at the time because I was like the assistant trainer and I was more focused on my career. But now to look back on it and say, like, I had a hand in that guy doing well, you know, you always want the people you train to surpass you. Like, that's you know that's because that's a that show that at least shows that you put in the work with them. Random question before John spurts off another one: Do you remember everybody that you trained? Because uh, I don't know. God, two years ago when we talked to Hentai, he forgot that he trained Elias. And we, um, had, we had to remind him. I didn't have. I I took Hentai trained a lot more people than I did. So I remember. I, I remember. I don't remember all of them. Like I, I would remember all of their faces. So there are faces I, I can picture in my mind right now, but I couldn't put names to because they either didn't stick with it or they never kind of did anything. Um, you know, and, and like people come and people go, you know what I mean? Like, so they're like, it's, you know, especially the guys who never made it into the ring. Like, I don't really remember any of them. Um, and that's not to be an insult or anything like that. This isn't for everybody or like, you know, real life can intervene and everything else. So like, but um, I don't think I've trained enough people yet to be like, I, you know, I have active workers who I don't remember. I trained. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. You know? Yeah. Okay. But yeah, so there like, are definitely people I don't remember, but it's because they never, you know, they never, they never took it to, they never made it to the like, 
I'm at least a professional getting paid to work. All right. On that note, um, was there anyone, and you said the last interview when we talked to you that, that you just know nonsense. Like if somebody sucks, you're going to tell them straight up, Hey, you suck. You need to work on this. Was there someone that, you know, you just thought "Eh, this guy should find a different line of work. I, I didn't know whether, um, one guy who also has surpassed me, uh, that I really, I I don't mind saying surpassed. I mean, like he's just so good in the ring now, but I I wanted to put over facade. Like, uh, yes, he's another, he's another guy. And like, and like, you know, he's one of those guys. I mean, like, I hope we get to lock horns again. Uh, like, uh, you know, in a match, uh, I, I'd love to, I'd love to wrestle any of my students that, that, that did well. And like, he's done so much. And I, you know, once, and I will say to my discredit, I certainly didn't think he was going to be nothing, but I didn't think he was going to blow up the way he did. Like, I, you know what I mean? And, and that's not an insult to him. I just like, he got himself into tremendous shape. You have to understand when I've met him and he was training, he was a skinny little thing. Like, and he really, and he was quiet, nerdy, like, you know, and, and like, I don't think he'd mind me saying that it was the truth. And now he's a physical, he, he's, he's a physical specimen. He's incredibly athletic. Uh, he's got a cool girl that, you know, Danny's awesome. Like they're a great power couple for the wrestling business. Like, you, you know, I, I just wanted to put him over real quick for a second because he's one of those guys who, you know, like at the time, like, you're like, I don't know. I don't know if this guy's got it. I mean, he's listening. He's re- super respectful and, and he's definitely a student. And, and he's, I wouldn't kick him out of class. Like, uh, you know, he's got something, but like to get as far as he did, I wouldn't have expected that. And he's surpassed my expectations and surpassed me by like, you know, a mile. So good for him. Yeah. And he pops up. Uh, I'll say this real quick. He pops up on cards literally all over the nation. Like, yeah, holy he's, dude, he's, shit. He's in San Francisco on Tuesday and on Wednesday. He's in Alaska and like, tell- he just everywhere. The last time we got in the ring, we did a little quick thing for Instagram where we, we beat each other up a little bit. And I, um, uh, and, and, you know, but I, but I, you know, I, I gave before like that, that when I finally well, like met, was like saw him again, I gave him a big hug and I was just like, I was like, kid, like, I'm so proud of you. And like, we, we, he's one of the guys who kept in touch with me, even when I left the business for a while, he was very sweet to me, uh, sent me messages and pictures when he was overseas. And like, you know, he's just a, like, a, like a good kid. John, your your roundup yep. question, yeah, yeah. Um, well, since you put him over, let's bury someone. Um, <laughs> no, was there, was there, I started to ask: Was there someone that you thought eh, maybe this guy ought to find another line of work that uh, oh, wrestling just wasn't time. for them? Yeah. yeah, 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 definitely. Like, like, like I, I mean, like there are guys that I, I, you know, like that I just, you know, like I said, like if you, uh, not I, there's nobody that made it all the way through to my knowledge that is like with me, that I thought shouldn't have been there. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit, you know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm hard enough that I'm like, you know, I, I, the, you just can't get that far with me, but there were definitely guys like there was a guy, I can't remember his name, but, um, I think he actually ended up training with other people later and then like somehow got in the ring. And I, I cannot remember his name and I'm not going to repeat the terrible nickname I made up for him in the back of my head <laughs> because it's not appropriate for this, <laughs> for the, for this or any other podcast, <laughs> but, uh, he like he was big like really big he had the size right but he just couldn't like do anything it was so weird it was like you, you know sometimes like a guy's really big and you know we've gone through this where like you have a guy like el gigante and like it sucks i mean i don't the guy could be not, the guy could save or- orphans on the weekends he might be the greatest <laughs> guy on earth but he's terrible in the ring yep and just because he's and just because he's big he's allowed to shit it up on for everybody if he can't have a good <laughs> Dude, I'm gonna say it straight up. If you can't have a good match with the Undertaker, you suck. Like, end of story. Undertaker could carry a broom through a decent match. Like, this is ridiculous, you know. And uh, and and it's like it. Like this guy had that kind of problem where, like, you know, if you can't lock up right, like the the lock up, the basic lock up. You know, like first day, okay. Second day, hmm, a little annoyed. <laughs> But the third day, now I'm starting to get pissed off. A month in, dude, I am livid. Like, if I'm yelling at you about lockups a month in, we're screwed. You know? Like, I'm sorry. It's that quick. Like, that, that like, something basic, you got to pick it up. And, and like, if, you know, if, you know, if you can't put right foot in front of left foot, and then, you know, 
put the left foot forward and, and <laughs> cinch the lock up correctly. And if I feel like, you know, it's like one of those things, like he would just, he would lock up and it was like, um, it was like the way Frankenstein would choke people, <laughs> you know, in the old black and white Frankenstein movie, like he would, like yeah. the Frankenstein's monster would choke people. Like two hands Straight choke, armed. And like, yeah. And he would just be like, you know, this, this incredibly, like, like I said, rigid, rigor mortis effect, like type of thing. And it was like, you know, it was, it was just bad. Uh, and, and it never went away. You know, and finally, like, you know, he kind of showed himself the door and uh, and and we were luckier for it. Uh, he, you know, it was one of those. It was just one of those deals. And, you know, it's one of those things where in his mind, it's like, when am I going to get in the ring? And I'm like, Jesus, kid, I, I can't get you through a lockup. Like, you know, and it's one of those things where I, I blame myself, except we had, you know, eight other students who were fine. So I feel like I was doing all right. Like some people just don't get it. You know, I look, you can go through the pedigree. I have no problem. I could go through all my students. They're good workers. Like I, you know, like anybody that got through was a solid worker. Like I, I stand behind the kids I trained like, but I don't tell you and, and these kids that I'm training right now. know it. I, you don't get to say I trained you. I will not. I will disavow. If I don't, if I, you know, if you go off into the wild without me until I say you're ready, you know, you're dead to me. Unless you make it to the Fed or something, then I'll just claim you anyway. That's mine. That's mine. <laughs> what do you think, Glenn, is, uh, as a trainer, the hardest thing to pick up for some of the kids? Uh, and the collar, the collar and elbow lockup may be hard for some people, but for the most, what do you think they, they have struggled not, with? I, look, people are going to be good. Even the most athletic guy that you're training is going to be good at some moves, bad at some moves, like needs work on some things. Maybe they take a flip bump really well, but they don't take this other bump really well, you know, like, but the hardest thing to learn is the storytelling, the pacing, uh, the storytelling, the pacing, why you do what you do when you do it. Um, the give and take of a wrestling match we were watching, uh, I just shared a clip of the brain busters versus the rockers. I, oh no, I shouldn't say this. I had the kids do an assignment where they went out and found clips and this one, one of the students found this. And I said, I'm so glad you posted this match because I've watched this match a million times and I share it with people because it is so illustrative of the brain busters aren't interested in Tully the way that they a, a heel part of a heel's job is to give the baby face opportunities to shine, to really look good. And the thing that Arn and Tully did so well in that match and just in general is they would look strong for a second and they'd already have the setup where the, like they did this protracted shine. I want to say the shine's like eight minutes long. It's crazy. Like, and it's, it's, but it's not, a, it's not like just, it's, it's not the basic shine that you see in a match where people, where the baby faces are just beating up the heels, the heels are doing stuff. And then the baby faces get over on them and then the heels do stuff and the baby faces reverse it again. And then the heels do stuff. So it like, it's this back and forth. It's this constantly being ready to give to the other person. Because the thing about wrestling is if you aren't like, if you are, are in this mode where you know transitions can only happen at this time and like i'm going to take 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 and if you're not constantly thinking about like what am i doing next not only for myself but also to just make this match good to give my opponent something like you're i feel like that's you know that look man there's a reason people like look rick flair just had his last match supposedly you know at 73 like like a lot of people look at rick flair as like the ultimate ring general right well, if you watch a lot of the stuff he does, it's, it's what he gives to his opponent. Like, you know, it, it's it, that, that that's the magic of this business. Like, you know, and, and that's it's super hard to teach. And I'm not even saying that I've mastered it. Like it's it, it's an you know, it's a constant. It's a con that that is a thing that you're like constantly thinking about when you're planning a match, when you're doing your when you're doing your stuff in the ring and all that. We're really pulling the curtain away on this one, but that's all right. Um at this point, who cares? Like nobody, you know, I care, but nobody else does. So eh, might as well, like, <laughs> you know, um, 
Uh, but like, but seriously, like that's part of the art and and people don't understand how much skill it requires. It's, it is the reason these people are trained professionals. The reason they make good money. Part of it is this, it's like, and it, all these guys that you think are really great, you know, like, um, you know, like, like I'm thinking of like the great tag teams and things like that. Like these guys that you think are really great are really great because they understand that it takes two, four, six, depending on how big the match is to tango, you know? Yeah. Great, great point. Uh, I love that. Yeah, that's really selfish, great insight. Selfish, selfish guys, single-minded guys. Like you know, a lot of guys are selfish outside the ring. I want my pay. I want my spot. I want my title. I, I'm not saying that. Look, man. Uh, you know, Kevin Nash said it best. You can either make friends or make money in this business. But that being said, selfish people in the ring, mm, not as good. You know, not going to make that money then. Essentially. I mean, look, if you're it, like, you can only smash tomato cans for so long. I mean, like I said, like a Goldberg push is only interesting for like, what, a year, year and a half, two years tops. Like, you, you, you know, could... if there's not some drama, if the chance, if, if there's no chance that you can ever lose, what am I paying for? You, you could have probably, instead of using tomato cans, said can crushers, or you could have crushed cans to kind of throw us, but that's okay, Glenn. That's okay. Tomato cans is where your mind's at right now. Promotion like, in during the podcast. I, I'm using I'm I'm using the I'm using the term. I know. Like, I know. Like, I know. I'm being a professional here. You, you damn Mark. I know. Go ahead, John. You have one more. That was it. No, that that was great. Great insight. It really was. Um, Mark, I know you're Jones into. I, I need a road. The Mark. I need a road trip story. Let's go. All right. All right. So I wanted to start off with like, um, so I, I kind of want to do this in somewhat chronological order. I'm not going to be able to do it all in chronological order, but um, especially because my mind is just a stew. But I want to talk a little bit about the Devil's Advocates run because we, we talked a lot about we did we did do a fair bit on Japan. Um, so my first like decent run in the States was as a part of a tag team with uh, Devil Budokan, who is the guy, I, if you were listening to the last podcast, go back and listen to that podcast later on. Um, but I talk a lot about him because Jim Foss at Devil Budokan was my mentor. Uh, I have his gear right over there. I'm looking at it right now. It's in my man cave. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, God rest his soul. Jimmy isn't with us anymore. I miss him all the time. Uh, I think about him all the time. Um, he did, you know, so much for me. He's a, he's an absolute bona fide Pittsburgh legend. He's helped so many people in this area, especially for my generation. Um, so, but Jimmy and I, Jimmy took me on the road. We did a lot of stuff together. Uh, and I wanted to tell a couple of fun stories with Jimmy and also with Jake Garrett. Jake Garrett was the third member, the mastermind, uh, sometimes manager, sometimes wrestler in our like kind of trifecta of people. Um, so here's a couple good ones. They're just little quick things. Um, I think you'd appreciate just little side things. Uh, Jimmy and I used to do weird stuff, like to mess with tag teams that we were wrestling. And so on the road, we would do stuff like, uh, I'd be chewing a piece of gum and we'd be talking over the match and I would take the piece of gum out of my mouth and hand it to Jimmy and he'd start chewing it. And then he'd hand it back to me and I'd start chewing it to, to kind of psych out and mess with our opponents. Again, this is all pre-COVID, folks. Pre-COVID. Yeah, pre, way pre-COVID. COVID was just a glint in, uh, you know, a glint in some uh, laboratory animal's eye. By the uh, way, by the way, folks, uh, God, uh, Devil's Advocate, three-time IWC Tag Team Champions. IWC Tag Team Champions, feuding with uh, very much often feuding with sexual harassment, but many other teams, including some of my favorite opponents like Ring Crew Express and burning river brigade um so uh yeah so anyway so that was one uh there's a great show we did for there was a a short-lived company i i don't think it exists anymore especially but it did like i don't even know how many shows they ran back in the day um but uh uh madmar wrestling i want to say out of ohio maybe i've never even heard of this one so this is gonna be good okay yeah yeah, it was like uh, like the name was an amalgamation of two guys who ran it. I don't, I, and I, I think that was the name of it. Like I said, I think it was two guys. Who, anyway, some show out in Ohio. We're out there. We did like two shows for them, and uh, there, they the promoter was friends with a guy who was a what is it where you can just not move your legs? 
He could move his arms. Uh, Paraplegic? Yeah. Yeah, because the quad thing? is all of them. So, yes. Quadriplegic is all of them. Yes, you got it. Yeah. So, he was paraplegic, right? And so, he desperately want we're heels, and he desperately wanted to, like, do something with us. So, we're trying to figure out, like, heel stuff that we could do to this paraplegic kid. And it is great, because it was like, holy crap, like, you're, you know, what could be more over than us like, grabbing this kid in a wheelchair and beating the crap out of him? Like, it's the meanest, <laughs> oh, you my know? God. Right? And so we're like thinking up, but, but Kimmy and I were crazy as shit back then. And we like, we definitely did too much. Like we were always trying to do like crazy spots and like our finisher, I felt like was really innovative. Um, he did, uh, he would put the guy in a surfboard and I would do a frog splash on top of him, the top rope. We called it theater of pain. It was, it was pretty crazy for the time. Um, and so, uh, we were like, what can we do to this kid? And so we, (laughs) We kept trying. One of the things we used to do was a double. We would pick, hook a guy for a double suplex, and we'd brainbuster him. So we we kept we locked this kid's wheelchair wheels, and we kept trying to pick him up for a brainbuster. No, but the wheels kept the wheels kept slipping, right? And this is the kind of personality that Jimmy had. It always made me laugh. He was such a. He was like so quick witted. <laughs> we hook him for this. We pick him up. Ah, it's not going to go. Good for the, Finally, third time we put him down and I turn around to Jimmy and I go, I go, I'm like, I'm like, Jimmy, I, I think we could really hurt him if we do this. Yeah. And without skipping a beat, Jimmy goes, really? Could it get any worse? Oh my <laughs> God. And the kid in the wheelchair, literally, the kid in the wheelchair literally looked at us and he just started laughing and shrugged. He's like, ah, eh, probably not. <laughs> wow. I can't believe what I'm hearing. I know. This was old school. You could get away with it. You could, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The kid was a good sport. We blasted him with a drop kick. Um, a double drop kick like Rock and Roll Express? I think I actually drop kicked him. Okay. Uh, uh, but uh, we, he, was a, he was a very good sport. It did get us over his heels. Um, clearly when, when I was traveling with Jake Garrett, uh, we did, we were doing shows for union of independent pro wrestling out in Erie. Uh, I, this is another one that I just, I, like I said, these are little stories, but I, I just want to get them mem- mem- memorialized somewhere. Um, I love telling this one, uh, Jake and I were very different in terms of our appearance and stuff like that. Jake was a kind of uh, the kind of guy who looked like he was swilling Jack Daniels and like rough and tumble he is the axe murderer, the mastermind, the, you know, had a very like, like rough biker type of appearance. Um, and I was, I was really in shape. You know, I, I was, I was 195 pounds ripped. Yes. Ripped 11% body fat. And so we do this crazy show and, uh, uh, you know, I'll get I'll give you the whole spiel. It's great. So Shirley Doe is wrestling Sebastian Dark. Okay, and it is a hardcore match. It is for the heavyweight title. And we're as the evil heel tag team champs, we're to jump them. Okay, and then they are going to fight us for the tag team titles right in the middle of their match. And I had just gotten this pristine white gear. Okay, new gear. And so Jake and I are sitting there in gorilla. We're waiting for our cue to jump out there. We're sitting there. We're sitting there. And before the match, I had talked to Sebastian. Now, Sebastian Dark, notorious for bleeding. Like, he was a hardcore guy through and through. So was Shirley Doe. But Sebastian was, like, the kind of guy, you know, like, a couple hits to the head, he was bleeding. Um, and I, I, I asked him before the match, I said, Sebastian, for this match, man, you guys, you know, like, big baby face pop, you know, it's face versus face. Then we run in. Like, there's no reason to bleed. I just got this white gear. I was like, buddy, please do me a favor. Please don't bleed in this match. Oh, uh, no. I, You're such a dick. So, I, so I hope he bled all over it. So, so, I, so Jake, uh, we're watching the gorilla. I turn away, and Jake starts laughing because that's how he is. And he's like, he's like, Glenn, you might want to, you might want to take a look at this. There is blood everywhere 
the ring is not the greatest ring. So it's got like dips and depressions in it in different places. And there are pools of blood. You could go swimming. Oh my God. Like, like a blood slip and slide. <laughs> and so, so now I'm hot. Daddy Spectre is hot. We get our, we, our cue comes, we hit the ring. I grab Sebastian. I throw him in the corner. I hit him with one fucking stiff forearm. His head throws back. He's got long hair. I am covered in blood. I'm so fucking haunted. I grab him. I push him into the ropes. I go to call my first spot. And he goes, brother, I'm, I'm, I'm dying. I think I'm going to go out. And I said, sorry, kid. I got to get my spots. <laughs> I give him a hard ass Irish whip and he doesn't make it all the way across the ring. He literally takes like two steps and just face plants into the pool of blood. Okay? In, yeah, basically like just, just we're all covered in, in Sebastian dark hemoglobin at this point. What I didn't know in a crazy turn of events, they did us, they were doing the kind of a standard hardcore match and they had a stop sign, totally safe, normally totally safe, you know, hit him, hit the guy with the stop sign. You know what I mean? And, uh, but it was a real stop sign, you know? And so, you know what a stop sign is? I think it's an octagon, right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. yeah. I work with them every day. Yeah. <laughs> they hurt. Uh, they hurt. Yeah. So, so Shirley Doe hits Sebastian with the stop sign, lets the stop sign go, safe hit. Say bump by the freakest of accidents. The stop sign hits the mat. It bounces. It goes perpendicular. And it's like a hatchet. Oh, God. It's stuck into Sebastian Dark's head. Oh, oh, God. I had no idea that happened. He didn't cut himself. He is legit dying in the ring of blood loss. We had no idea. So... Word that like I still have no idea. I'm pissed off because I think he did it to himself. <laughs> oh <my> God! <laughs> Is that not wild? It, and so I'm laughing, uh, but I'm grossed out now too because I can yeah, picture it like just mul- stuck into your head. Yeah, there's multiple situations where like. Jake smartens up to Jake is more experienced at the time, and 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 Jake also is maybe at the time a little more giving and a little more forgiving, and he realizes this is this is fucked. We are in trouble, and he's literally trying to pull the baby faces on top of him to finish the match. <laughs> get us out of here! <laughs> like we get out of there, you know. He has to go away in the ambulance. I suddenly feel like complete shit, you know. Because I really felt like, you know, on one hand, boy who cried wolf, this guy bleeds every match. You know what I mean? Yeah. But on the other hand, like, I, you know, this really was truly an accident. Uh, so we get back. We're with the promoter, um, Kingdom James. And so Kingdom James got us like these. Um, they were kind of it's a weird hotel, like motel situation, because they're like you rent instead of the in the place it was in Erie, instead of an actual like motel room, they were like trailers you rented. So I'm in a trailer with Kingdom James. Uh, you know, so we went and we went and saw Sebastian at the hospital. He gets he's fine. They, they like he lost like two quarts of blood or something. Like um you know. Yeah, so he has a dr- a blood transfusion, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And, no, no, it's, he's not, fine. He's fine. He's fine though. Now he lives, you know? And so we know he's fine and that's okay. We get back to the fucking, we, we, you know, we, 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 we hit the diner. We get back to the, we go back to the, the, the trailer thing and Jake and I are sitting there and I, I'm like, I don't even know what to do. So I just start working out. Jake's drinking. King James is drinking. And, uh, and I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm not only am I not indulging, but I'm also just doing push-ups, like hundreds of push-ups, right? Because what's that going to do? And Kingdom James and, and Jake Garrett are sitting on the couch, and, and I'm in front of them doing push-ups on the floor. And they're trying to, like, relax and drink and stuff like that. And finally, Kingdom looks over at, at Jake Garrett and he goes, Oscar, how long is Felix going to do this? <laughs> In reference to the odd couple, because we're yes. traveling together. 
you know? Right. <laughs> like, how long is Felix going to do this? Which was great because it broke all the tension. Uh, you know, because it was a weird, uh, it was a weird night. Clearly. <sighs> yeah, to say the least. Um, okay. So I told a couple, I told, I told a Hamrick rib story. I want to tell you how I got the only time I ever got one over on him. The only time I ever got back at him. So in the last episode, I talked about Hamrick and, uh, and he was great. And dude, did you see he was on GCW? I did. I did. Oh, he killed it. He, yeah. Dude, he, he's, he's still great. Yeah. Um, so, but I did actually rib him once and not only did I get him, I have the proof. I have the receipts. So I'm going to, I'm going to tell this story and I can verify it. One of the times that, so I told you like uh, Hamrick and I did some work as extras on the, for the fed. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so Hamrick would always play it off. Like, you know, and, and he was right. He's a vet. He's super experienced. He was on ECW and all that shit. And he, like, we got there and you know, like it's, you know, I've been on the road with Hamrick for a while, like doing, like doing these shows in Ohio for new era pro feuding with him there. Uh, I wrestled him in KCW and Altoona. So I'm familiar with Hamrick now and, and he's great. And like, I'm learning a lot. So, but we get to the fed and I'm, you know, my first, uh, this is my, my first or second time as an extra. And I'm like still starstruck by the whole experience. Number one, like $200 cash right up front from Sergeant Slaughter to go to the table, bam, right to the pay window, daddy. Just like Dusty Rhodes used to say. And then, you know, and then you get to go off to catering. And like one time I'm like at catering and I'm like sitting with Gene Snitsky and like, you know, it's like, oh man, like this is the Fed. And, uh, you know, uh, seeing Hulk Hogan in the, um, in the hallway, you know, and stuff like that. And so, um, so we're at the, we're at the, the WWE thing in, in Pittsburgh and I'm, I'm super excited to be there as an extra. I can't wait to, you know, I don't, I know like if I'm doing anything, I'm probably doing a job, but who cares? Like, like this is my chance to get in front of people. And so Arnie Anderson has a bunch of us young guys like go down to the ring and like wrestle. And I, I look at Hammer and Hammer doesn't come down with us. And Hammer goes like, he, he like, he looks at me and I'm kind of like expectant, like, Hey man, aren't you going to go like with us? And he's like, he's like, Glenn, they've seen me a million times. I've done a gazillion jobs on this show. They know exactly what I can do when they want me. They're going to call. He's like, what I like to do when I come here is get paid, and then I disappear. I don't want to do shit. I don't want to do shit. I'll see you later, kid. I want nothing to do with this. But basically, if I'm here, I would prefer to just be paid and left alone. I don't want to do anything. And he was determined not to do anything on the show. Uh, you know, and so I went down to the I, – I go down, and we wrestle in front of Arn Anderson, which was so awesome just to do. Uh, like, you know, just me, I'm like, I'm working out with a couple of their guys there. I'm trying to think of who's there. Like, um, just like, you know, some indie notables, I think Chad Collier might've been there and, um, a few other guys we're all like working like spots and stuff like that. Just kind of like, you know, we're working out in front of arm. And so we do that for probably about 20, 30 minutes. And then, you know, it's like, Oh, we're getting ready for the show. We're going to start doing this the job matches for heat or whatever. And, uh, Arnie Anderson comes up. And like I said, dude, first time on Anderson comes up to you it's like holy i mean like dude you're like god to me like holy shit yep. like this is so crazy and so we're, we roll out of the ring and i happen to just be the closest guy to arn and arn's like we need uh we need guys to be security to break up uh to break up the edge um matt hardy fight and i'm like you know and he's like uh he's like glenn and he said somebody else i don't know who it is you can go back and watch the video because like i said there's a receipt of this you can find this on youtube he's like glenn somebody else and he turns around to me and he says glenn is there anybody here you know <laughs> oh no <laughs> and i look i do i do this it's so great this is like the only time i've ever gotten one on hammer because he's much better at ribs than i'll ever be but uh, you know, I never really had the chance again anyway, but I always like the, dude, this is with all respect to Hammer. Cause like I said, he was so good, man. He's so good in the ring. And so I learned so much from, but I had to get him after the boot thing. And so I look up the ramp and then I said, well, <laughs> Mr. Anderson, I don't know a lot of these guys, but I know Chris Hammer. <laughs> <'Cause I pointed laughs> <to> <laughs> and Hammer gives me this look like, 
you motherfucker. <laughs> and so now myself, some other guy, and, and Chris Hamrick, who's so tall and so distinctive, you watch the video, like it's so obviously him, dressed up like cops for the Matt Hardy pull <laughs> I got to go it's back worth, and watch that now. Yeah, I got to go. Kids, it's worth the Google if you know that Chris Hamrick wanted nothing to do with it. <laughs> like, He's got to he be was a pro. pissed he, during it, he isn't was a, he? Hey, he was a pro. He did the job, baby. We all, we all, we all dressed up like cops and did the job. Find it. Find it. We're going to post it. John, that's your duty tomorrow so it can go up uh, the no, day after I this. don't know. In the in the big book of ribs, I don't know if that counts, but it, to me it counts. It's, like, it's a win. I would count it. Yeah, yeah. It's a um, win. So we had talked last time on the show about, uh, and I actually because this cat this cat just turned forty, and I I recorded a quick video about this for his fortieth birthday because his wife asked me to. The greatest rib ever played on me was played by a man who also doesn't get enough credit for the work he did in the business, Ohio kid named Chris Cole. Um, Chris Cole started in mega, went all, you know, wrestled all over the place, wrestled in Korea, a few other places, like a uh, really good kid. Once again, another guy should have gone farther, but fate is fate. Uh, but so at the time, you know, especially after my first Japan tour, I was really trying to, you know, I was, I was wrestling for a living. And so like, I was really concerned about cash and money and stuff like that. And Cole had gotten work out a deal where we did like, we did like a, a couple triple shots in Ohio, which was just awesome to be like, it's like I had work on Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, and it was like, uh, we do like Elyria, Cleveland, and then um, Cincy, you know, this yeah. show was in Cincy. This show was in Cincy. And so it's the farthest part of the drive. It's Sunday. I'm already in a shit mood because I'm a moody prick. And like we drive out to Cincinnati after we had like the first two shows were good. And I'm like, let's just get this Sunday show over with. And it's going to be me, Brandon, Xavier and Chris Cole in a three-way dance. So it's going to be a fun match, but we get there. Now this match is taking place in an empty storefront in the strip mall. Okay. And here's the problem. It stayed fucking empty. Okay. Uh. It was it was still empty when the card started. <laughs> like and so there were a lot of fans, uh, as Dennis Gregory would say, there are a lot of fans dressed like chairs tonight. <laughs> um were you no were you number one on it, the show? The opener? We were we were probably think, the second match. We were real early on the card. Um there were a couple weird circumstances in that card, like some very strange backstage antics and like other things. I don't remember the promoter and I was never asked back because of what happened, um, which I'm getting to. But uh, um, Cole knew how how much I was like, you know, I was very like, hey, man, this is my pay. This is how I live. Like, it's shit, you know, but that's like, this is how I make my living. So like, I like, it may be a pittance to you, but this, I need this money. Like, and, and so Cole knew how like oriented around that I was like how serious I was about like cash and stuff like that. And he very much used that to, to his advantage on this one. Um, so I look out at the crowd of like five people and I'm like, Cole, and we sit down and I go, Cole, we are not getting fucking paid. There is no way we're screwed. Like this show is, is done. I was like, and I am going to have a complete meltdown when this promoter comes back and tells us he has no money because the gate is is nothing. Um, and Cole's like, hey man, you know, we'll go out, we'll wrestle our match. It's like, don't worry about it. I'm sure, I'm sure we're gonna be taken care of, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, Cole, there are five people out there. <laughs> I don't even want to wrestle. And uh, you know, we're not getting paid. And I just want you to know when we're, when we don't get paid, I'm going to have a meltdown and it's going to be fucked. Like, and it might get crazy, you know? And, uh, and by crazy, there was an implied threat of violence. You know what I mean? Right. 
And Shit so, is getting thrown. <laughs> stuff's getting broken. I understand where yeah. this is going already. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like by crazy, I mean this might end in fucking a nine one one call. Um, and so we go out and wrestle our match, what it is, and it's fine for what it is. And I, even in front of five fans, I give them a little. You know, like I'm, I, I like I, I do my best. Like it's hard because. I'm pissed off about the money in my mind, everything else. But I go out there and I, I fucking, I'm a professional and I, I get us through a, a good, you know, as good a match as I could in front of five people. Um, and so we get back to the back and I'm pissed still and I'm just annoyed and I want to see my wife and like, you know, all that crybaby bullshit that I should have gotten over a long time ago, but like, I'm me. And so, uh, you know, Cole, with what I should have seen as a mischievous gleam in his eye, but I didn't notice at the time because I was so I was so in my own head about this whole situation. He goes, uh, he's like, Glenn, he's like, don't worry about it. He's like, look, I'm going to go get our pay and then we can go do whatever. And I was like, OK, man. And so I'm sitting there and I, uh, Brandon, I'm sure, is with us. And uh, eventually Cole gets back and Cole's like, Glenn, I don't want you to freak out. And I pop up immediately and I'm like, I want my fucking money. I said, and I'm not leaving here without my fucking money. And I'm like, I'm, I'm probably turning many shades of red. Like, you know what I mean? And so Cole's like, <laughs> do you guys remember the Subway Sub Club? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So back in the day, young people listening to this, Subway had a promotion where every time you bought like a six inch sub, you get like a stamp. And if you bought a 12 inch sub, you get two stamps. And if you put like, I want to say eight stamps on a card or 10 stamps on a card, you get like a free six inch sub, right? Yep. That, so, was, that was free $5 foot belong, folks. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Cole, so Cole's, Cole's trying to calm me down. And he's like, it's fine. He's like, look, he's like, it's fine. Like it could be worse. He's like, it could be worse. Uh, like, and he's he's kind of like, you know, he's he's trying to back me off because I'm like, I'm 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 walking towards the fucking uh, gorilla position, uh, which is down a hall and around a corner to where the curtain is. And I'm like, I'm gonna fucking kill this promoter. I was like, I I don't you know, I don't give a shit. Like I'm 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 at my wits end. I uh, you know. I've been on the road for, for three straight days. Um, I, and, and, and I need this money. I, I like, I have rent to pay. I, I, you know, I'm eating out of tuna cans. Like I need this fucking money. And so Chris Cole goes, don't worry, Glenn, we're not getting paid, but <laughs> oh God, I know where this is going, but, you know? And I was like, I knew it. I knew it. I'm screaming. And everybody's looking at me in the locker room. I knew this motherfucker wasn't going to pay us. I knew it. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, like just yelling at the top of my lungs. I knew it. You know, I threw my bag. Ah, because I love to throw my bag. Um, and and he's and he goes, but <laughs> and he hands me one of two filled sub club cards. <laughs> he did. He did give us these sub club cards, so we can go get a sandwich. <laughs> There's a subway. In the mall, <laughs> so it's not a it's not a total loss, and I don't know why I didn't realize that was a joke. But I literally like you have to understand. I watched a promoter pay a referee with lottery tickets. Okay, oh so like God. holy shit! So so like like you know with like like you know the scratch off tickets where you win like a buck or two. Yeah, like with like. With like ten, like 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 two, three dollar one scratch off tickets. So like I've seen promoters do some really fucked up shit. Like so, I fucking blitz past Chris Cole. I am now in a full on run down the hallway. I come around the corner. There's the back of the promoter. I fucking point. Hey, you motherfucker! You are gonna fucking pay me right fucking now like and i just scream it i don't care who hears like he turns around he looks like like a deer in fucking headlights like he has no idea what's going on 
I suddenly feel Chris Cole's arms wrap around my waist. He pulls me back around the corner and he's like, oh my God, you psycho. And he throws, he thrusts this envelope into my hand and he's like, here's your money, you crazy asshole. He's like, he paid us. He's like, he's like he paid us. Jesus Christ. I didn't know you were going to freak out like that. And I was like, Cole, you saw how hot I was. Why would you let it get that far? Yeah, as soon as you head down the hallway, he should have, like, grabbed you then. Needless to say, I was never asked back to that promotion. <laughs> I don't know why. I Sounds like a, a legit, you know, good good way to have a, a good rapport with the promoter. Yeah, that, that one didn't go so well. That was, uh, uh, Daddy's temper got a little out of control. <laughs> did you get the sub though that's the depressing question <laughs> i should have demanded the sub i should have been like after you cost me the job at least give me the sub uh, i don't really feel like wrestling in front of five people though regardless of the money so yeah so where did that the was, subway cards come from then i love oh they were colts oh uh, okay that makes sense all right yeah 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 he just he had them on hand that's why i said like in the in the grand scheme of ribs, I'm sure there are better ribs. Like you hear about all these, cra- like they're just in crazier situations because there's more money involved. There's people shitting in each other's bags and <laughs> dosing each other with drugs, and we never had the money for any of that stuff. But um, in the grand, that's scheme not of ribs, nearly as creative as I was about know. to say. I think for pure cleverness with what was available on hand, Cole killed it. it it's definitely my favorite rib. I yes. Yeah, I, uh, I, John, if you would have did that to me, not that we're in wrestling, but anything stupid that we do, you know, I would have been Glenn in that whole ordeal. I would have went ape shit crazy because I'm, yeah, I'm a little bipolar sometimes. Yeah. I probably would have stopped you before it got to that. I can't believe you let I it go that of, far. I kind of appreciate that he let it like, cause I feel like with something like that, you gotta, gotta let it sit and see what happens. And I, 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 I don't think the story would be as memorable if I didn't chew the promoter out for no reason. <laughs> Touche. Touche. <laughs> um, the little details. So then, the little details. So, but yeah, it was good. It was good. Like, but I, I think Cole, like, I think there's a little spot in Wrestler Heaven's, like, uh, like, Hall of Ribs for, for Chris Cole. Like, because when it involves Wrestler Pay, I feel like it's especially kind of good rib because we're so used to getting fucked. Like, that's you know, um. So in Japan, yes, I pulled I pulled a few good ribs in Japan. Uh, once I felt comfortable, um, I don't know how great they were for <laughs> the people. Um, you know, uh, the the two that come to mind right off the bat is there was a guy in DDT who had a kickboxer gimmick. So once I had gotten like I'd been in DDT a couple times, um, there was a guy who was there who was a I, I know his family was somehow involved monetarily i don't remember i like i i don't want to like disclose his name like but he was one of the guys that was working there and also i believe and once again like there's language barrier i could be screwing this up that's part of the reason why i want to leave his name out of it like but i believe that his his there was some family investment in the company also um but we got along really smashingly and he took us out to dinner and a, a bunch of other things but he was definitely like a river and like to screw with guys. And so like when we were on the road once we took the, there was a guy who was a, he did a kickboxer gimmick and he actually wore these modified boxing gloves so he could wrestle with them, but they could also punch with them. He, he was, he was like a tie boxer. That was like his, uh, okay. his gimmick, uh, in DDT. And he was a good worker. Like this is not, we didn't rib him because of his work, but we just ribbed him because fuck it. Like, and so one time we took one of his boxing gloves before a match and we soaked it in water and stuck it in the freezer. <laughs> <laughs> and so then, like, by the time, by the time he's like, you know, by the time he got to it, it's like, unusable. Did he go out with so just one? That, I don't know if that was, yeah, just one. And I don't know if that was more of a rib on him or his opponent. <laughs> like, because the, the glove is like rock hard. Um, and then one time, same guy, I don't know what possessed me. Like, I wonder if this eventually ended up with me not being invited back. Like, but like Every story's ending at, with that, Glenn, by the way. Every story's ending with that. 
we're we're at uh we're at this like he took us out to all these great places and i'm gonna tell the legendary japanese strip club story um but we one of the places he took us before the strip club was um he took us to a uh a uh, Korean barbecue style place, like a place, you know, it's one of those deals where they have a, um, Shabu Shabu is the pot. I think it's Yakiniku is the, is the grill. And so, but Neil State there's a grill in the middle of the, of the, of the table. Okay. And they keep that heated and then you, you get stuff and you put it on the grill and then you eat it. Like, and it's like a, a cool, like family style like thing. And so, Bunch of us wrestlers there. So he, the first thing he, so he, he starts this whole thing. So one of the guys with us is Futoshi. Futoshi, uh, back in the day, uh, his gimmick was that he was insanely fat. Like <laughs> that was his gimmick. His finisher was literally, he would get on the ground and then roll over. you. Yes. Like, that was his finisher steamroller. Okay. And so, and he was really, he was the fattest Japanese guy I ever met. Like, and he's not even a sumo guy. Like, like, I mean, he was legit. Like literally built like, you know, like a like a like a basketball, like you know, just like totally round. Um, no, net. nice guy, N- nice guy, absolute sweetheart. Um, but you know, he's he's one of those guys where you're like, is this a gland problem? And then like you eat with him, and you're like, this isn't a gland problem. This is a fucking <laughs> eating problem. <laughs> like, so Futoshi, we're at this Korean style barbecue thing, and so Futoshi gets up to fucking. <laughs> So we all have our own little like like little fork things that we you know we can prod the meat with and then and then pick it off and put it on our plates. And so Futoshi has to go to the bathroom. So Futoshi excuses himself to go to the bathroom and, and this dude nudges me and I'm like, oh shit, here we go. What are we gonna do now? And so he's like, keep an eye out for you know, like what tell me when Futoshi's coming back. He takes Futoshi's grill fork and he turns it around and sticks it on the grill. <gasps> Yep. Oh, I know. <laughs> and so I'm watching, I'm watching, I'm watching. Futoshi comes coming out of the bathroom. I'm like, take it off, take it off, take it off. He takes it off and puts it on his face. Futoshi <laughs> sits down. First thing he does, grabs the fork, picks it up for like a second. He's like, ah, what the hell? <laughs> like, uh, and I'm like, oh my God, we could have like permanently scarred that kid. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> We're really like, but I'm like drinking now and I'm like getting into this. I'm like, oh, this is fun. And so then this kickboxer guy, and I like, I gotta say this again. Like, I like and respect this guy's work. I have no idea what possessed me. But now this guy's riled me up with the fork gimmick. And so I'm sitting next to the kickboxer guy, and the kickboxer guy's bragging about his girlfriend in Japanese, but he's showing the pictures. And I said, Can I see the picture on his like cell phone? It's like a little flip phone. And he hands me the flip phone. I don't even look at the picture, and I just throw it on the grill. (laughs) (laughs) (sighs) Which gets a big laugh out of everybody but him. That kid probably fucking hated me. I thought he was great, though. I really do mean that. (laughs) You're just digging yourself out of a hole. That's all you to keep doing by saying he's great. I'm just trying to fit in, guys. You know? That's it was F then because those things are like nine thousand degrees. You know, did it just melt on it? No, no. It like I think it just burned the back of it. Okay. Like it, it, it really like it's uh, like I mean it did permanent damage. I'm sure, but it wasn't like it wasn't a non functional <laughs> Yeah, it still and worked, the, Mark. It was and the, cra- the crazy part about all this. I say this all the time about being a, an American wrestler in Japan is like. They just kind of expect you to be a barbarian, at least at that time. Like, nobody, like, I would do weird shit, and people would just be like, it's fine. Like, Baka Guy Jim, you know, stupid foreigner. Like, he just doesn't <laughs> understand our culture. And I'm like, this is, like, it's, other people would be offended by by this entire population thinking you're an idiot. And I'm like, dude, this is carte blanche to do whatever the fuck I want. Like, it's, it's just like, oh, you're dumb. You just don't understand. Right. Okay, <laughs> like that's fine. Um, How much so, fun, John, would we have had if we were on that? Just as the marks that we are, just being idiot, we would have joined in. We would have been killed yeah. by all these guys. That's though. the thing you want to you want to feel like you're part of the group. Yeah, you want to feel like you fit. And plus, this guy was like important in the company, and like 
and I liked him. He was cool to hang out with. He was fun, and he like kind of had an American personality. Like he was a little more warm. Um. So your, he takes us. Go ahead. Your best ribs are on your friends. I agree. I I completely yeah, agree. I, like I said, I I absolutely I wrestled this guy on the show. He put me over. Like I had nothing but respect for him. Like you know, um, I I I I, I so like in a certain sense, I feel bad, but I, I really was just trying to fit in. Okay. Um, so the, 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 this is like just a weird culture shock story because of the way like hostess clubs are versus strip clubs. Um, and like I said, remember all this information is dated. This is from like 2004, 2005, you know? So, um, this guy springs for us to all go to a strip club. It's me, this guy who will remain unnamed, um, Dan Shuko Dino, my tag partner, uh, Futoshi and I think Kumachan, who were the two guys I was staying with at the time. Um, and so we, we go to this hostess club. And so a hostess club is not like a normal strip club. It's different. Now, the important part of the story is I had just gotten married two weeks ago. So I am like absolutely, you know, in, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm married. I'm in my like good zone. You're you know. supposed to be good. Yeah. And, 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 and I would never like, I, I, like, I, I, I want to stress now I, you know, I've been loyal to my wife forever. I've never been disloyal. And, and she knows this story like, but it, it is a crazy story. So we we're, we get to this hostess club and I'm like, what is, you know, what, what, what's this all about? Like, I, I figured it's just a strip club. I've been to strip clubs, you know, like what's a strip club on a bachelor party. Like, it's kind of a, like a thing guys do. And like, don't get me wrong. I'm not a strip club kind of guy. Uh, I actually find them kind of boring. Like, you know, I, the, like it, it's, it's not my scene. I, you know, I'd rather be with, I'd rather be around girls. You know, even when I was single, I'd rather be around girls. I felt like I had a chance with instead of girls <laughs> who are just trying to extort, extort money out of me. Yeah. That's so called it, marriage that's, anyway. So yes. Right. Sorry. So it's already like, I'm already like, this is awkward. Like, but I'm going to see it through. This is what the guy wanted to do. Once again, he's important in the company. Makers Mark Whiskey on tap. Like, you know, like if that's, they just, all, the, each table, I don't know if Makers Mark was the big thing at this place or whatever, but like every table had Makers Mark Whiskey. It was like little, like two to four person tables. Maker's Mark whiskey, bunch of glasses, pitcher of water. Okay. And so I'm like, where's the, where's the stripper pole? Where's the, where's the dance area? Like what is going on? <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm all right with the maker's so, mark so far. What's that? I'm okay with the maker's mark so far. I'm oh okay. yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah. So we start drinking, you know? And so these girls come out and there's four, there's, there's four or five of us and there's there are five of us, I think four or five. Yeah. Because like I said, there was the guy and then like three other wrestlers and me. So five of us, I think. And then the, and then, and so there's five of us and like, they send out these girls, you know, and needless to say that the important part is they send out one girl for every guy. Right. Okay. And they come out just in like towels. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, this is, unusual and so this girl sits down in front of me and she starts talking to me right and i'm like okay and she's like talking in broken english and i was like well that was nice they sent the one that can kind of speak english I'm just, <laughs> fantastic all right like but i'm like this is this is so strange i'm like what is going on and they're like i did not understand any of how this worked okay and so now like the fear is like, believe me, sex is the last thing on my mind right now because I had just got married to the woman I am still married to today. Like love of my fucking life. The, the best thing that ever happened to me, still the best thing that ever happened to me. And but, so this girl is chatting me up and I'm like, my wedding ring is like burning a hole through my hand right now because I'm sitting here and I'm like, as the conversation goes on, I'm like, there's like, at first it's fine. 
I keep expecting a dance to happen or something. And when it doesn't, there's this slowly growing fear in the back of my mind. What is it? What's the nature of what is going on in this situation? And I'm like, oh my God, did this guy buy us horse? <laughs> like, <laughs> oh my God. I took you to the Japanese bunny ranch. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, oh no. Oh God, how do I extricate myself from this situation? I was like, because I'm like, the, what is the, like, this guy is like, you know, relatively important in the company. Like, I don't, you know, and I'm like thinking of like all the weird shit about Japan. I'm like, is this like, am I going to disgrace this guy when I'm like, you know, do I have to like secretly pay this girl on the side? Like, hey, look, tell him we had an awesome time. And like, I really gave you one good or whatever. <laughs> like, this is, you know, <laughs> dude, I am like, everybody else is having the time of their life. I am literally in a cold sweat, like, like a guy with like a fever. Like I am like, I am like, Oh my God, this is so bad. This has gotten so bad. And so then I don't, I don't want to get too graphic on the podcast, but like the girls take their towels off and they start doing what I can only describe as like tricks, <laughs> like oh. not, not, not turning tricks, like, uh, like prostitutes, but like, Doing like, like, tricks. Tricks. yeah, I knew it. I knew it. Like, yep, like, like sucking water up into themselves and shit Jeez, like that. Jeez, Louise, right? Right, and like, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, one of the girls, like, you know, she oh, god, I, I don't know what's safe to say on a podcast these it's days. It's explicit, but, like, it's god, she, I think you went, put, yeah, yeah, she puts like a a tampon in herself and then like has the guys try to like pull it out of her. Like <sighs> it's wild. Wow. Man. I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm still horrified. Not because of this, this shit's funny, but like I am horrified because I'm like, this is like, is this going to escalate? Like this is, like I said, in my mind, this is the beginning of a, of a prostitution transaction. Right. Yeah. I would think and the same so, thing. And so literally I'm a, like the, the girl comes, she sits down next to me. I'm fucking about to crawl out of my skin. Like not because she's not attractive, not because she's like, you know, sweet girl, whatever, blah, blah. But like, like I said, I was married two weeks ago. I, I've been with this girl for almost five years. Like, and, and like I said, she's the best thing that ever happened to me still is like, and so like, I'm like, how do I get out of this? <laughs> without losing my job like you know and so the whole time i'm just i'm cold sweat trying to fabricate some story like i was literally think, contemplating like maybe i just pretend i'm so drunk and just throw up right now or like, maybe i can get myself to throw up like anything to get out of this situation without either a like it was funny i dude there was a part of me because i was playing a gay character i was like about to be like you know what actually i am gay like, <laughs> like, like anything to get out of this situation and then suddenly like like you know like god himself descended to save me a fucking disco ball comes down from the ceiling music hits the girls give us lap dances they leave business cards and they go the fuck away and they just send out more girls and the same shit happens over and over all night not all night we i think oh. we only did two rounds Still, it was, yeah. So it's like, like I said, the girls leave us business cards, which once again, I don't know anybody out there who like. There's a, probably a bunch of weaves listening to this somewhere. Like, I don't know what the yeah. What's their business? Is. Yeah, I don't. Well, I'd imagine, like, I'd imagine the business card is for if you want more. Please, like, you, you two are both idiots right now. Of course, that's the business card. It's called a business card. Yeah, they want to make one I, transaction. I, if any weebs listening to this can confirm, I, I guess the business card is if you want to go all the way, but thank fucking God that was not what was on the menu. Because like I said, I did not know how to get out of that situation and keep my job. But luckily that was not what happened. But Jesus, was it scary. Disco saved your life. <laughs> yes. 
that's the Japanese strip club story. One of my favorite stories to tell because it's just so weird. Like, I, I would be interested uh, to know if any Japanese, I, I, like, a lot of guys have gone to Japan. If any other workers who are listening to this have gone to Japan and gone to a hostess club, I'd be interested to know if they had the same experience. I'm sure a lot of them were single at the time, so they probably didn't have the same problems that I did. If I was, don't get me wrong, if I had been, if you know, if I was single at the time, would have had the time of my life. Like, yeah, we want to hear your Japanese strip sto- strip club stories. Make sure you contact yeah, come, us. Come on, Can Crushers. Get, yeah. yeah, exactly. Come on, Can Crushers and give more Japanese strip clubs. But dude, that was crazy. Yeah, I I can feel like feel you like two weeks of marriage. You're still legit in the air quotes like honeymoon and everything, even though you've been with her for five years. I I would be the same way. I'd be the same way now because I, it's not my thing either. Oh, yeah. like I'd I be said, crawling like, I, inside myself. I I put my wife over all the time, man. I I'm not joking. Like the the you know like a, a good person deserves your faithfulness, and like I uh, you know like I'm not I'm not talking my wife up or overselling it in any way. My wife is the fucking coolest. I have no problem saying it. It's not because I'm whipped. She really is like, you know, just how it is. I don't care if people think, you know, once again, you all think I'm whipped. You, you don't live here, so you don't know how how we interact. But trust me, uh, I have a really good relationship. W- was she wondering about your body language at all? This this Japanese girl that was working? I, I have uh, no idea. I, I really don't know. Like I, like I said, I was so in my own head. I have no idea. I feel bad because I probably came off like the weirdest motherfucker ever. Like with this huge, don't touch me vibe. Like it's probably like, why is this guy sweating so much? Yeah. Oh, it was wild, dude. I, I think I sweat through my fucking t-shirt like completely, you know, I, I got to uh, ask right, this. Like, did, did any of the guys take the business card? Then definitely don't give a name. But did anybody take well, the business well, card? Dude, we all took the business card. <laughs> like, out of politeness. I don't know if any of them used it. Okay. We all took. Okay. Just wondering. Just wondering. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, yeah. So, that's, like, that's the Japanese trip club story. I always love telling that one because it's just so, like, it's hard to, like, explain to people how weird it is, how different it is. I like, feel it's dirty like right now. It's like karaoke, which is like a Japanese, like, you know, the term is Japanese, but it's so different in the United States where you would do it in front of people, like just in front of a crowd of people. A lot of them are like strangers. When we did karaoke in Japan, it's in a little room with only with the people you went with. Like, it, it's like, it, like karaoke in Japan, karaoke in Japan is a very intimate thing. It's something you do with friends. Like, oh. it's not something you do with like a bunch of strangers. Did, which song did you sing? Uh, we actually forced the J- Japanese guys we were with. I was with uh, Shirley Doe at the time, and Shirley Doe and Farnsworth and Noah and I, uh, we made them sing the Liger theme song, oh, nice, which okay. we loved. And so we were drunk, and we we just would scream the part where the girl says Liger. <laughs> that's the only part we knew. Right. Everything else is in Japanese. <laughs> You you hinted on the ladder. Do you have any? Do you have anything else? I'm going to try to twist your arm for one thing. Uh, I'm going to talk. I want to talk a little bit about Upstate because we talked. We we talked okay. a lot about like the Japan stuff and everything else. And like, um, I I was just going to say my like uh, like other memories of like of like my early career. Um, you know, mo- like before now. Um, I wanted to put over Upstate Pro Wrestling too. Uh, I had I they gave like. You know, whenever I get a chance, I, I like to put over Mike Rosario, who's the promoter up there. His, his wrestling name's Hellcat. Um, he did me a real solid when I was real young coming up, and we did some wild stuff in Upstate. Uh, I feuded with Brody Lee for a year there. Um, you can catch most of that stuff on indie wrestling TV. Uh, not all of it, but at least a lot of it is memorialized there. Um, so, like, if you go through, if you go on indie wrestling TV and you go to their like uh, their Upstate channel. Like, you know, there's a bunch of old shows and and a bunch of my shows are on there. Some really great matches that I was involved in, Um, you know, and like obviously with Brody Lee's recent death, like, you know, a rest in peace to him, like, you know, just a super solid dude, uh, fun to work with. Um, He was another guy who like, you know, I will say for what for what it's worth, like with his size and ability and charisma, like I kind of thought like, oh, this is a guy who could definitely fucking make it. Um. I also, it was funny. I, I was, I was, I, I looked back on some of those shows and I realized that uh, for a while, uh, Bobby Fish was my lackey. 
and that was wow. really cool. Wow. Bobby Fish should be he should be everybody's lackey. He's great. He's so funny. The one thing they don't use him as, it's really funny now because like he's like, you know, like crazy striker, or, like I'm the best kicker, or, like, you know, and, and don't get me wrong, he's fucking awesome and he's good at all that shit. But um Bobby Fish uh actually has incredible comedic timing and is super funny. Uh and when we were doing like comedy promos, he was so over. Um as like he he would come in with like just the goofiest shit and and he'd be amazing. Uh, his his wrestling name back then was Jerk Jackson, and he was great. I, re- I remember that now. Now that you brought it up, I was I was trying to think of his his indie name back then. So yeah, Jerk. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we we like he was he was in my posse back then. Um, like uh, some really great memories. I've shared some of the promos from back then that, that like are are pretty funny that we did. Uh, we wrestled. One of my favorite matches that we did back then, and you can see this on your wrestling TV, is uh, it was uh, myself, Bobby Fish versus Brody Lee and Chris Canyon. Um, so fun, uh, wow. especially the hype up to the match because Brody Lee does a great call out. We go to beat his ass, and Chris Canyon does a run in. There's this great line I lay on, uh, like I was very self aware at the time, and and I had you know I was the NWA uh, Upstate Heavyweight Champion. And I, um, I said to Brody Lee, Brody Lee was like, I, you know, I want my title shot. I, I deserve my title shot. And I said to him, I said, I said, Brody Lee, uh, and this is great because Bobby Fish is right behind me. And he's like my hype man. And it's so awesome because I go like, I, I said, I said, let me explain something. I don't give title shots to mid card comedy talent. <sighs> like. And and the, the the joke the joke being that up until up until NWF said put the heavyweight title on me, I basically was mid card comedy down. Um and 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 the best part of me saying that line, totally improvised, Bobby Fish is like, Oh no, he did it <laughs> Like the greatest like the greatest hype man ever. Like that you ever see that like that viral video where all those guys start like being like, oh laughing yep. and stuff like that? You know, yeah, it was like that. He's like, Oh no, he did it. <laughs> like, and it's just great. It's just great. Um, I had such a good time up at upstate. We did some wild stuff. Uh my my first match in upstate, I wrestled of all people. I did not realize this at the time, but apparently this is true. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I believe Cindy, who I wrestled, it was the joke was, you know, they brought me in and, uh, and like, and they, you know, the whole gimmick, cause I was doing the Wonder Man gimmick was they thought I was a woman, right. Until I got there. And so I walk out and like, Cindy's like, what the fuck? And then I just beat the shit out of her. Like, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and so, you know, and she was a real sport about it. She was very nice. Um. I think if I'm correct, Cindy ended up marrying Brody Lee. I think that's Amanda Huber. Really? I believe so. I'm sure somebody can wiki that shit. Hell, I could probably do it right now. Yeah, um, yeah I don't. I am computer recording right now, so I don't want to mess up with that. But yeah, hold on, I'll, I'll, I'll actually look. But like, I I believe that. Uh, I don't know if it's in her wiki or not. I have no idea. Um. I'm shocked but you know how to use the, it first off but okay one of the um one of the one of the uh upstate wrestlers later told me he's like do you do you realize that your first match was actually against Brody lee's wife and i was like uh okay that's crazy um, yeah so if that's actually true that's fucking wild um wow so yeah, I don't. I I like. Yeah, Cindy Sam. Yep. He struck me as someone who had a really good sense of humor, Brody Lee. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and he was he was he was a, like like a super good guy. So yeah, so Cindy Sam. So I I squashed her, and then um, the craziest part was it was super over. Like I wrestled, I, I went all the way up there, and I wrestled for probably five minutes, and I was like, "Fuck, man, I don't think this is going to be anything," you know. And so at the time I was doing um, Miracle Ecstasy, which is like a choke slam bomb. And so I, I was like, I was like, hey, if you're okay with taking it, you know, it'll be wild because I'm going to smash you. 
And so I gave her the fucking choke slam bomb. Boom. Like one, two, three. Crowd is pissed. They want to fucking kill me, which is the goal. Like, and they were pretty hot. Like they were, they were pretty close to real hot. Like I, I was actually feeling a little bit like, Ooh, might have to fight my way out of this one. Like <laughs> that so, white heat. Yep. Yep. And so, so I slide out of the ring. I get out of there and I don't think anything of it, you know? And, um, and, you know, and they asked me back and the second show I did for them. And like I said, I don't know what, what Hellcat saw in me or whatever that he was like, we can do something with this kid. He, he's like, uh, I get there. I have no idea what they have planned. And he's like, um, he's like, you're going to wrestle uh, Danny Doring tonight and um, you're going to win our heavyweight title. And I was like, what the shit? <laughs> like, all I did was, I just beat up some girl last show. What's going on? <laughs> like, he's like, yeah. He's like, that's the plan. Like, and I'm like, okay. And he's like, we got a stable for you. I was like, okay. And so he's like, what I want you to do is go out and like cut a promo about how you're going to wrestle Danny Doring tonight. And, uh, and like, you're going to have these lackeys and he's like, you know, just do something like, you know, he's like, you know, your gimmick, like figure it out and like get some heat. And so, the, <laughs> so I'm, I'm sitting there and in the back at the like little catering kind of thing they have, they don't have like a full on catering because it's an indie, but like they have like water bottles and they have, uh, like a bunch of fruit, right? Nothing wrong with fruit. So, well, so, so there's this big ripe bunch of bananas, right? And I'm talking to my my crew at the time is Bobby Shields, Freddie Midnight, and oh, this is before we had Dirk Jackson. This is uh, Jake and Bake, I think was the other guy's name. Weird group of kids. Like, but Freddie Midnight really fit the gimmick because he like he kind of looked like a like he just had a. <laughs> I I hope he doesn't mind me saying this. He had a real twinky kind of look to him. <laughs> like, so he really fit, you know? And so, um, so I'm like, I'm, I'm like, what can we do? What can we do? And of course, like I've been doing all this crazy shit in Japan. So I'm like, I, the shit I'm thinking up is way over the top. And I'm like, all right, here's what we're going to do. And I grab these three kids who are a little bit younger in the business than me. And I gather them around and I say, look, I got a plan. We're going to go out. I'm going to cut this promo before I do. Okay. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to have this robe on. You're going to take off my robe. Okay. And then I, I know you're going to be uncomfortable with this, but here's what we're going to do. One of you guys is going to fucking come up to me. You're going to put your hands on my fucking chest. You're going to go all the way down to your knees and you're going to pull this banana out of my trunks and you're going to have to do it with your teeth. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and Freddie Midnight was like, me, I'll do it. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. He was like, he was like, I am on board. <laughs> and I was like, thank God, somebody's on board to get this gimmick over. And so we get out there. I get to the middle of the ring. I'm Wonder Man, Glenn Spector. I'm going to fucking, you know, you know, I'm going to make you all extremely uncomfortable. They pull my fucking robe off. Freddie Midnight comes in front of me and, and like, like a lover. He just puts his hands on my shoulder, goes all the way down my chest, gets down on his, on his knees, fucking pulls the banana out of my trunks with his teeth. The crowd goes fucking ballistic. Like, I'm sorry. I'm not saying New York is homophobic. I doubt they are now. But damn, they wanted fucking my blood. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? They go apeshit. Right? Right. I... I cut my fucking promo. I fucking get out of there. I get to the back. <laughs> Hellcat comes up to me and he's like, the kid that was, uh, he's like, that was great. He's like, uh, never do that again. He's like, what were you thinking? <laughs> he's like, never do that again. What were you thinking? Uh, we, this is a family show, you fucking idiot. <laughs> like, you, you can't do stuff like that. He's like, you can take the gimmick so far. That's far enough. <laughs> you gave me free reign, though. Go ahead. Yeah, he told him, go out there and get heat. Uh, he was right. Though. I, like I said, the problem with promoters is, you know, you know, it's not his fault. Like, like you never know how crazy your workers are actually going to be. 
He should have been more specific. He, I agree. I, he should have said, don't put a banana down your pants. <laughs> I wrestle, I wrestle Danny Doring. We have an awesome, fun match. Doring's great, by the way. Uh, at one point in the match, like, we start out with just some regular wrestling, and Doring really wanted to do some wrestling wrestling. So we did that shit, and the crowd's actually into it. And, like, uh, we get to this one point, he's got me in a headlock takeover, and we're in the headlock, and they're chanting. And it's a fucking headlock takeover. And I was like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, I'm like, you know, I, I whispered to him. I'm like, we got him. And he's like, and it's like the Han Solo in, in, in the Luke Skywalker thing in, in, in a new hope where, where they're fighting the, they're shooting the tie fighters. He's like, he's like, he's like, don't get cocky. Kid. <laughs> <laughs> so we have our match and it's a good match. And, uh, uh, Abyss comes out, does the run in fucking hits him with the electric chair drop. I cover him, get the fucking pin. On uh, boom, I'm, I'm MWA Upstate Heavyweight Champion. And it's it, I was like, holy shit, this is wild. No company had put their heavyweight strap on me. Um, except for like Erie Pro Wrestling, which didn't exist after they put their heavyweight strap on me. So still waiting for the comeback. One. Still waiting for the comeback. Yeah, still waiting for the comeback on that one. Uh I so I don't count that one. But uh they, they put their heavyweight strap on me and and then and and the rest is fucking history, man. I had a, a great year run with them um i love all those guys dearly i wish i had done more I, I, you know if i hadn't got so far in my own fucking head i, I would have done more um i also got injured there which sucked uh but that was way later um like i said brody chased me for a while so we had some matches where we had matches we had some matches with him that like ended inconclusively or i fucked him over uh and then um like you know i had matched with some other guys and 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 he would be you know he would be chasing me doing whatever he like well, like one time he had to wrestle a bis in a cage you know the other time like he had to do whatever you know all this trying to get to the heavyweight title and uh and it ended with our cage match um and and if you watch the cage match at the end he says the nicest shit about me because i i mean like when you when you have a program with a guy for like a year like it changes things like it, it like, you know, it, it's, it's like everything was building up to this moment and it actually meant something. Um, and I like, I consider it a point of pride that like when they did like the fed, like retrospective on him, like the first clip in that fucking video is him coming off the top of the cage and hitting me with a cross body for the finish in that cage match. Uh, that cage match means the world to me and anybody can watch it. It's on YouTube for free now. Like you don't even have to get IW. I think in your supporting stuff like indie wrestling TV and fight and fucking IWC network, all those things are really important. But like hell, if you're flat broke, go on YouTube right now. You can watch that cage match. Uh, I stand by it. I think it's one of my best matches. Um, and and it's wild. We 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 bump on thumbtacks. You know, I gig. Uh, oh shit, industry term. I get cut on the cage. Uh, <laughs> you know. Um, and I, I couldn't have worked with a finer guy. Like, you know, and I like uh, I feel like it's weird because like I didn't know him later in life, later in his life. And so I don't want to like claim some kind of false, like, you know, like bullshit, like friendship. We weren't like good friends, but I did feel a loss when he when he died because it was one of the most significant feuds I'd ever been involved with. And not only that, but like when you see a guy like that make good, like it sucks when he get the rug gets pulled out from under him for no reason. You know, like good dude. Um, you know, my run in upstate was fucking fun and good. I took the title to Japan. I wrestled Minio Fujita for the title in a tournament in Japan called Cruiser's Game. Um, making it in a legitimate world title, you know, in terms of it actually being defended in other parts of the world. Um, and and uh, Hellcat put me in his Hall of Fame in the Rochester Wrestling Hall of Fame for that. So, uh, which, like I said, like Hall of Fames are Hall of Fames. You can take them as seriously as you want, but it, it meant a lot to me, you know? Right. Well, let me say this. Do we have more? Because we're getting to the the ticking time bomb. Yeah, um, yep, yep. We're, we're, at, we have... we're at that show point. I want, to, I want to at least get that line. I've literally gotten everything that I put notes down in, so I'm happy. So you have more notes to come for part three, because... No, I I would definitely come back for a third part. I have no idea what I talk about then. I probably talk about new stuff then. Like, but that's like 
that this is like kind of a good plot synopsis in terms of like this is like what like a lot of my wrestling life was there's still more of course i could always dig around for like you know i i had fucking wrestling matches like fake you know like unbooked wrestling matches in waffle house parking lots with guys that yes. we were, were out after shows we did all kinds of crazy shit but i i uh um like this is a good like i i think you've gotten a lot of like what i would consider like you know if you give a shit about my career this is the essential glenn specter stuff and i wanted to get it memorialized somewhere where like people could listen to it because i don't you know you never know what the next day is going to bring and i i want to make sure that it's at least somewhere if i never get a chance to write it down well we'll, we'll schedule part three because I don't know if you asked, but it is written down from my notes. I still want to know the Farnsworth story about the zipper. Oh, shit. Hold on. Can I tell it real quick? It's funny. I, I'll, I'll bang it out super quick. Oh, zipper go ahead. Ripper. Zipper Ripper. The legend of Zipper Ripper. All right. So, like, like yeah, this is, like, as much as I'd like to start a part of three with this, this is actually a good one from Japan. So, our first tour of Japan. Holy shit. Uh, poor Farnsworth. Like, we have the craziest flight schedule. It is Pittsburgh to Toronto to Montreal to Japan, right? Whoa. And there's like a huge and there's a huge fucking fall crushing layover. So we get to Toronto, um, and and on the way to Toronto, I don't know, I don't know, or maybe it was at Toronto leaving to Montreal. One of the layovers was long, okay. Long enough that we needed to chill somewhere and figure out what the fuck we were going to do with ourselves. And everyone's strung out already. And we, we haven't even got to Japan yet. And poor Farnsworth, I don't know if it's because he looks like a terrorist or whatever. <laughs> but they, they took him into that room where, like, they're going to violate you anally. Like, <laughs> like, they separated him from us and drug him away. <laughs> Okay, and we're like horrified. We don't know what to do. Like, but I guess he had the look. Like, you know. I, okay. So, so he was getting abused. Like, you know. And so finally, we get to like a, we have like a like like a layover where we have like a little bit of like hotel room like time, and and we're supposed to chill out, right? But none of us can chill out. We're all fucking crazy already from this little bit of fucking trip, and. Barnsworth, he can't, I don't even notice what's going on, but apparently he's struggling with his bat, with his luggage, right? Like his zipper won't come off. And so when I am made aware of this, it's because he has an epileptic type fucking fit of screaming and cursing. And he literally tears his fucking suitcase in half. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> and so so he has this berserk fit, and we're all just like, it's like a bomb went off. And we're all just standing there staring. And then Noah, <laughs> Noah out of nowhere, like, t- like almost in his instinctual way to like dissipate the situation, is he goes, Noah, Noah's like, oh, are we okay? Yeah, you're good. Yeah. It was like zipper ripper, zipper, and then he starts making songs about. It. He's like, "When a problem comes along, you must rip it," <laughs> and he's just fucking with him even more. Farnsworth had gone so berserk on the suitcase, he lacerated his hand. Oh my god! Oh my god! So there's like blood involved. The whole thing, like he has to get his fucking shit. Uh, taking care of because he fucking cut his hand open on his suitcase, ripping it apart. <laughs> and also, also, it's his fucking suitcase. We need to like, we need to fix it or whatever to get going to the next. Place. Right. <laughs> so it's a total clusterfuck. But that was like, it's the one and only time I've ever seen Farnsworth lose his cool, and he lost his cool on such a, like, it was such a magnitude <laughs> like the, the like the like amount that he lost his cool was insane like it was a literal like watching someone go crazy uh so yeah that's that's the zipper ripper story baby we'll God. always live like 
I, I, I still to this day occasionally call him Zipper Ripper, like, because it's just like it was such a great fucking moment. Like it, it, like it, it, it was one of those things that like there was a lot of you know there's there's tension because we don't know what to expect, you know, whatever. And it was one of those te- many tension clearing moments that we could look back on and laugh while we were on the trip. <laughs> yeah. Yep, been there. I, I've never ripped the zipper though, but uh, yes, yes. And when I say ripped the zipper, like I said, he ripped the fucking suitcase in half, dude. It was a, it was a complete meltdown. That's awesome. He That's like hulked wow. out on that suitcase. He, like the way Hulk used to rip those fucking Hulk rules T-shirts off, he ripped the fucking. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great place to end that's definitely a great place to end Glenn will do some digging we we need we need the trifecta now it, it's it's like having the godfather on the show we can just keep this going be, uh, the problem is now it's gonna get played out I'm really gonna start be scraping the barrel bottom of the barrel for fucking good shit at this point but yeah hopefully I, we'll make some new memories I'm trying to make some new memories yeah we'll get it going we'll get it up Glenn I thank you <laughs> This has been uh, amazing. To, I, again, John got his questions, and I got everything I wanted. All these road I, I'm stories. Breathless after some of these stories. <laughs> no, I had so, dude. Like, I, like this is the reason, guys. Like, you know, like people are like, "Why would you go back at 44?" And it's like, dude, I like you. You can't. It's an addiction, man. Like, this is like I said it. Like, uh, you know professional wrestling i'm i meant what i said it, it, it like as much as like you know as much as the sacrifices that, that are made and like the you know your body gets beat up and like you know there's so many disappointments and so many trials and tribulations it, it is the greatest human endeavor like and and part of it is this wildness this this just the, the cast of characters the weirdness like all the crazy situations you know like uh i'm very lucky to have been a part of it yeah uh, very quickly, you mentioned Ric Flair earlier. Last question, I promise. Do you yeah. do you get it? This desire to want to keep going? Because people have, you know, some Fuck people yeah. criticized his last match. <laughs> Fuck yeah! Do you get it, <laughs> dude? Right? You know what? I'm a I'm a Rick. I'll be a Ric Flair defender at, at like if that's what it if that's what it takes. I, I if I can find the quote. Fuck! I'm gonna read it right now. This is the this, this is the thing about Ric Flair. I'm gonna read you a quote. It's I I like. I saw mixed martial arts, uh, mixed martial arts academic brought this quote up. I, I knew the quote existed, but I had forgotten it. Now it is like my life mantra because this is the thing I try to explain to people. And when people shit on Ric Flair's last match, look, man, it's not a five star classic. Who gives a fuck? And who gives a fuck what Meltzer thinks anyway? Yes. Like, you know? But um, but I'm gonna read a quote and and like you know like I'm gonna try not to get choked up because every time I read this quote like I feel it so hard like but when I was thinking about Ric Flair's last match and I, and I think about this with a lot of guys like you know like I love watching like Ricky Morton now who's still wrestling Robert Gibson like these old guys I and you know I'm slowly working my way to being one of those old guys and I hope I can still do it at fucking sixty you know and and, and seventy or whatever else but um you know. So this this is called the Man in the Arena. It's it's a Theodore Roosevelt quote, and I think it's amazing. And I think it's the thing that people need to keep in mind because because people look. I love the memes about Ric Flair's last match as much as the next guy. They're fucking hilarious. I'm not saying you can't poke a little bit of fun, but when it comes to the honest to God criticism, I would just keep this in mind. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by the dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best, and this is the most important part, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Love it. Very well said. Love it. Uh, yeah. I, I, that's amazing. And that's the thing, if I, if, like, if I could put my coming back to wrestling now and I could put my whole career into any kind of perspective, and I use career in fucking air quotes because 
I know I never fucking made it to that upper echelon, but I, I, I will put it this way. I would like to die one day being known as a man who failed, but failed daring greatly. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great way to add. I, I, yeah. Way to bring it down from a Japanese strip show uh, to. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to feel all the emotions, babe. You took us on a roller coaster. Yeah. All right, Glenn, one more thing. Uh, we'll get another one set up for you, but we will definitely see you September 10th in Clearfield. Yeah. Would you say? It's going to be great, baby. Like, do not miss it. Like I said, man, I, I, I have. I'm telling you guys, if you're listening to this podcast, I'm not saying this to be arrogant because, like, whatever. I'm not trying to just put myself over, but I'm telling you, I have a little gas left in the tank. I'm going to deliver some more good matches. Uh, if you want to see some good matches, check me out. Pimp me to the other promotions. If there's any promotion you want to see me on, you know, please contact those promoters. Be like, hey, I want to see Glenn Spector. I hate to ask, but, like, I feel like if you don't ask, that that's part of the problem with this whole social media thing. What it comes down to is people have to ask promoters to see you. So like, you know, right now you can see me at IWC, but if there's a place you want to see me at, get on that social media and demand it. You know, they don't want to hear it from me. They want to hear it from you. They really do. They really do. Because Glenn will put asses in seats and it'll make him money. Right. That's exactly what it is. At at worst, I'm a good hand. I'm going to help you get your guys over. So at worst, at worst, because you're not the worst. So, no, uh, fuck you. <laughs> no, I, I was, I wasn't even a backhanded compliment this time. It was a good one. Didn't you give me a fuck you. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. It's been awesome. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Hey, make hey. sure you crush that fucking whatever like button, follow, subscribe. Because can crushers are awesome. Uh. They, you know, like I said, when they approached me, I, I listened to their podcast ahead of time to make sure it's something I want to be a part of. Like, if you are listening to this, make sure you support them, guys, because honestly, the only way this content gets made is is through support. Yeah, agreed. I agreed. Thank you for that uh, PSA. That was nice. I wish, I wish my co-hosts would do that every once in a while. But nonetheless, <laughs> talk to you guys, soon. Seriously, thank you for having me on. I love it. John. I'm speechless. Wow. I'm sweating uh, again. <laughs> How do you choose a favorite? Some, I'll tell you some things that stand out to me. I never thought I would hear the term uh, slip and slide of blood or bloody <laughs> slip and slide or whatever he said. It was like a, a Night of the Living Dead story he was telling with like the stop sign sticking out of the guy's head. John, those stop signs, you know, I've put them up before for work and everything. Sure. They they are sharp. And I understand why, you know, you hit them the way you hit them and everything. But I'm going to look at a stop sign differently now when I have to put them up for, for work. Like, I'm now scared of a stop sign. What if it drops on the ground and bounces yeah. straight up and it's like, this, correct this word, this heads me, dis- whatever. Would it beheads me is the word I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Beheads you. Yeah. yeah. My, I guess it could. It, right? <sighs> Mine was the storefront story where uh, Cole screwed him over with the subs. <laughs> like, unbelievable. That's that's the best rib. I, you know, all the, oh, they hit my boots, shit in my bag. That's just so uncreative. Yeah. That was a great rib. That is taking it to the extreme to get that, was that beautifully far. Done. Like, yeah, it sounds like he was a millisecond from putting a cap in the promoter's ass. <laughs> if you can pretty much say that, <laughs> right? Uh, yes, absolutely. And, and while all those crazy stories were a lot of fun. He really offered a lot of insight into what makes a match great. I mean, you and I enjoyed the hell out of the Rockers versus the Brain Busters because we loved wrestling. We didn't really know why we enjoyed it so much, I guess. But uh, Glenn really breaking that down piece by piece and explaining why it's great, it gives me so much more of an appreciation for something I already loved anyway. 
Yeah, I agreed. I agreed. I, I like how that's actually like one of the matches he makes the students find or watch or, you know, whatever going right. through training. So, yeah, An- another unbelievable one. And I was I was hoping we would, you know, have the Farnsworth story of going Incredible Hulk on your luggage uh, <laughs> for part three. Because, yes, there's, there's he's got more stuff. It, and it just, I don't know, it feels like just three guys sitting here drinking beer, talking wrestling. It, he does most yeah. of the talking, and there's two stooges, me and you, just listening, going, uh-huh, oh, yeah, what else? What else did you do, sir? Uh-huh. Like, it makes the job easy, I guess, right? Yeah. Yeah, you got it, someone that tells great stories. Just let him tell the stories. And he does. Yeah, he does. Guys, again, I'll promote it one more time. It's up and around our area. September 10th, Clearfield comeback. Uh, Glenn will be taking on Andrew Palace. Doesn't give two shits if he wins, loses, gets killed in the match, apparently. Um, as long as he hurts him. As long he, as he, he hurts he, Palace. He promised to hurt him badly. And you pissed him off. I'm glad he came back around. The first 15 minutes, I thought this was going to get shut down. Yeah. Yeah, he wasn't happy with my line of questioning, so yeah, well, tried to just one word. switch gears. Just one yeah. word. Yep. He was just, whoop. I'm like, well, we should probably shut this one down. Uh, looking out into the future, October 8th, Super Indy, that's something John and I will wave the flag of until the day we pass. Super Indy, the tournament IWC puts on year after year. You know, uh, everybody knows WrestleMania Four is my favorite tournament yeah. ever. Um all the super indies are number two, essentially. Yeah, right. Yeah. Super indies the best show they put on. Um year after year. Reset button's always a lot of fun, but super indie is just excellent. Yeah. So love to see uh Glenn at somehow in the super indie pay per view, um in the tournament possibly, whatever. Uh love to see him get another shot. That'd be cool, huh? Absolutely, yeah. So, yeah, a lot going on this week, guys. Super excited to have you on board. Uh, Again, if you're a wrestler and you want to tell stories like this or you can answer the the Japanese stripper (laughs) question that we've posed and you want to tell your side of the story, hit us up on all the socials, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. They're all at CanCrusher69. Or drop us an email at cancrusher69 at gmail.com. The, this is this is why we do the podcast. I love re-talking about what happens during the week, John. I really do. But this, this warms my heart. Hearing these, yeah. what do you call them, wackadoo stories? This yeah. is straight up fuckery. It, well said. Yeah. That's the best word for it. It is. All right, buddy. I love you. You'll be back on, I'm sure, before Super Indy, right? Yep. All right. You got it. Just remember, just because you're trash doesn't mean you can't do great things. It's called a garbage can, not a garbage cannot.